Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Target Jobs Virtual National Pupillage Fair. I'm Emily. I'm one of the law editors at Target Jobs, and I'm going to be taking some of your questions at the end. Uh, but first, I'm going to hang, hand over to our speakers. Um, so um, I'm delighted to welcome you all and um, welcome back to AJ and Lucy, who I believe have done this before, and welcome to Vina. Um, Commercial law is one of the highest paying and most intellectually stimulating areas of law. And these three speakers are all from large, well-known commercial sets. Um, and they're going to talk to you a little bit about um, their, um, their careers so far and um, any advice they have for those of you who are looking to go into law. Okay, so I'll hand over to AJ first. Great. Thanks very much, everyone, and thanks, Emily. You're quite right, I have done this talk before. Obviously, the main difference this year is that my hair is much longer, and that's a result of not having had a haircut since the first lockdown. My dream is that it will become sentient and I'll be able to set at legal research tasks and double my productivity almost immediately. It hasn't yet worked out that way, uh, which is a shame. There's a separate seminar to be done about how to brush your hair for video hearings. And the secret is to brush it all to the back. But um, if anyone wants to talk more about that, we can pick it up in the questions. Um, with that introduction, I'm going to assume, I can't actually see anyone in the audience. So I'll assume that introduction has gone fantastically well. And I'll move into the main uh, meat of the talk, uh, which is really, for my part, going to be focusing on um, three main aspects of commercial law, which really draw me to it. And which I think make it a very interesting and fun area to work in, because I'd imagine a lot of people in the audience will be weighing up different practice areas, um, having studied various subjects and found them interesting, but wondering what, what are they like in practice and will I enjoy them? So three main areas that really appeal to me about commercial law. The first of them is the international element of commercial work, because it's not an exaggeration to say easily 80%, probably more of the cases that I'm involved in have a, a major international element. Um, and that may be because the facts span multiple jurisdictions. It may be because the English court is actually in part applying foreign law, which always raises interesting issues trying to see the law of different legal systems through the eyes of those legal systems, because it's amazing the different ways that different jurisdictions can approach what are common uh, issues. Um, or it may even be because um, a court in another jurisdiction has already given a decision on the same issues or on related issues. Uh, and then you have to, all kinds of interesting problems about what the status of such a judgment is and its impact is in English proceedings. So just to give one example of that, um, I was involved in a case relatively recently, um, which factually was about a Ukrainian television station that had previously been proceedings about a, a related dispute in New York. And the English case was then effectively a kind of follow on claim. So you can see there just from that very brief summary of what was involved, all of the different jurisdictions that were involved. And it was fantastically interesting for that reason. Um, and that's, that's typical of you know, many of the disputes, which are, um, doubtless many of the panelists and lo lots of people will, will have come across. Um, and I find it really does add an interesting flavor to the cases that you're working on. Um, another um, international element, obviously, is that um, there are many offshore jurisdictions which are hubs for commercial litigation. And so in more ordinary circumstances and without uh, lockdown restrictions, um, Commercial law is an area where you can end up traveling and doing cases in other jurisdictions um, too. Um, something I have done um, relatively frequently prior to the lockdown. It did, did lead to an interesting uh, debate between me and a scorpion, which I found in a room I was staying in, where I was supposed to be going to court and there was a scorpion by the door. And so it was a strange kind of conflict of interest, which is really the conflict between my own self-interest in not being stung and my professional obligation to get to court. And, I, and I'm proud to say that I, I got over my fears and I got to court and I wasn't in fact stung. So, um, but you know, that, that's really anecdotal and probably atypical, but um, I wouldn't want to warn anyone off commercial law because of fear of scorpions, but, but I raise it largely for entertainment value. Um, so that, that's a few um, anecdotal um, examples about this very strong international element to commercial work, which I do think is a fantastic aspect of it. Um, the next thing, the next feature on my list, the second aspect of commercial law, which, um, which I really like, is that it, it tends to raise, especially in fraud cases, which is something I do a reasonable amount of, lots of 
interesting niche areas of law which come together in the most surprising ways. Um, and that legal interest is something which really um, draws me to it. So, I mean, if you're interested in the law of restitution or fiduciary duties or trusts or the economic torts, these are all areas which you may have come across in some cases only tangentially in your undergraduate uh, law courses or on the GDL, but which come together and become very important in a lot of um, commercial cases and in fraud cases. And it means you can end up doing cases where, you know, it's an area of law which started with a case about an opera singer breaking a contract or, you know, different kinds of oats in different bags and confusion over that. And suddenly you'll find yourself in this tremendously novel and modern and technical commercial context. And you're applying these common law um, cases to these very novel factual situations. Um, and, and of course, on top of all of that, everything I've just reeled off is really a substantive um, area which comes up in commercial cases and commercial fraud cases. Um, but also procedurally and from an interlocutory point of view, lots of um, fascinating disputes to be had, um, case about interim injunctions and freezing orders. Again, there are areas of the law that you, you might not have come across in a huge amount of detail in your courses, but which are really interesting um, to look at and to work in that area. And in fact, you know, one thing that might be worth doing, um, especially as everyone's probably watching this at home in their pajamas on their computer anyway, um, if you were to go onto Amazon, you'll see, you know, there's, a book, there's plenty of books, one's by Paul McGrath about commercial fraud, where I think for free, you'll be able to look at, look at the, uh, the contents page and you'll be able to see just some of the, the many weird and wonderful areas of the law that do come up in, in uh, commercial cases and in fraud cases. Uh, and that's something which really draws me to it. Um, the, the third aspect I wanted to uh, mention, the third thing about commercial law, which I find makes it an excellent area to, to work in, is there's a very strong aspect of teamwork. Because um, in some of these very large scale cases, inevitably, it's going to be a big team led by, you know, a leading lights, one of the, you know, the, the main uh, people, fantastic people to work with and learn from. And it will be a team stretching down then through, um, through senior juniors down to more junior juniors such as myself. And um, I, I have loved working in that way because I'm constantly inspired by the people I work with and learning from them. And so I find that obviously there's plenty of areas of law where there is an element of teamwork involved. It's just, it's such a well-established um, and common feature of large scale commercial cases that I thought that was worth mentioning. Of course, it's equally important and, and equally fun to be doing cases on your own. And that's something which there's plenty of scope to do, either doing the advocacy for a small element of a bigger case or else for doing slightly smaller scale cases um, on your own early on, which is something which is, um, I would obviously recommend and enjoy doing as well. But that teamwork aspect is something which I very much enjoy. Uh, briefly then to touch on a couple of other things. That's my, that I've rattled through three elements of commercial law that I find attractive on our list of bullet points that we've been told to talk about on pain of death. And um, one of them is uh, lifestyle considerations. What, what kind of lifestyle uh, impact might you uh, want to take into account if you're thinking about commercial law? Um, well, one thing I'd say, and I think it's worth being frank about this, is a lot of the work ends up being urgent for a variety of reasons. Um, for if it's something involving an injunction or for many other reasons, you can end up having to um, having to pick up the work at relatively short notice. Um, and that's something which I suppose is, is to be borne in mind. I can imagine in some other areas, there's less of an immediate time pressure depending on the nature of the dispute. But I think you've got to be ready to, to you know, get, get up and get going pretty quickly at short notice. So that's one lifestyle consideration which is worth taking into account. Another one which I think is, is realistic to talk about and important to talk about is that you know, there, there is a level of financial security that comes from working on commercial cases, um, which is which is something which I think understandably people will, will want to take into account choosing between areas. And it does have one very positive consequence, which is that when it comes to doing things like pro bono, you, you have a free hand to do whatever you might want to do without having to worry about how much time it might be taking. And, you know, so I, I've developed some niche uh, interests in trying to appear in as many different departments of the first year tribunal as possible. Um, and try not to adopt the same aggressive commercial litigation strategies as you might in other cases in those cases. But, um, but it's, a, it's a nice way to be able to do um, pro bono work and, and you know, shout out to Fru, who I think probably did a talk just before us, and equally advocate to, um, who also do a lot of excellent work. And um, that's a great way of getting advocacy experience. And it's something which can be paired quite nicely, I think, with, um, with a broader commercial practice. Very briefly then, so I don't overstep step my time, another topic on our list of bullet points was qualities that, um, that you might look for and, and which would be useful for doing commercial work. This is probably a bit generic, I think this probably applies to lots of areas, but for me I think that the two most important qualities I think in any area and for anyone working in the law 
it's just curiosity and enthusiasm because the fact is that um you know you can tell the difference between someone who's really looking to get to the bottom of it and find the answer and you know read the next document because they think it might have something fantastically interesting in it that's what's going to allow you to um to make progress to find the answers and to make convincing arguments so um, i think that's equally true of commercial cases and so i'd say when you're looking through the areas um see what grabs you see what you find interesting because at least my experience has been that it's by taking that route and following your interest that you'll end up um, enjoying yourself the most but also being the most effective so I think that's probably my piece. I'm going to hand over now, I think, to Vina. Thanks very much, AJ. Um, well, in terms of my, uh, in terms of what I was going to do in this talk, I was going to say a little bit about uh, my route to the bar, my background, and also what it's like to practice the commercial bar and the sorts of cases that I've come across. So there's a little bit of overlap between what um, AJ has covered and what I've covered, but hopefully there's a slightly different perspective and a uh, different flavour. Um, so I am a junior barrister at one of six court chambers, and we're a chamber that specialises in all areas of commercial law. I completed pupillage in October 2019, so I've been in practice for around a year. And fortunately, I haven't come across any scorpions yet. So there's your difference in perspective already. Uh, in terms of why I chose the bar and why I chose the commercial bar, I really chose the bar by a process of elimination over very many years. That's not, that's not an approach I would recommend to absolutely everyone. That's how I fell into it. As an undergraduate, I studied law with AJ, actually. We were just talking about how we overlapped um, for a year at Cambridge. And at, in that, at that stage, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I really enjoyed studying law and I enjoyed the sort of hard edged legal analysis and kind of getting into the detail of cases and trying to understand what they decided. And I wanted a career that would allow me to keep doing that. So at that stage, I thought being an academic was the way to achieve that, that that was my goal. And then I went on to do a master's in law and during that during that year that I, I, I spent in the US, I did a lot of research and I found that actually, I found it a little bit isolating and I wanted some sort of uh, real life application of all these legal principles that I enjoyed drilling down and getting, um, getting to grips with. And then I started to consider the bar um, because it seemed to me that that was the career that would allow me to combine the legal analysis and the legal um, research that I had enjoyed during my studies while still being able to apply it to a real life um, context. And that's really what, uh, what we do. We advise clients and um, argue positions in court based on the legal um, analysis and the work that we do in chambers trying to figure out what the best arguments are. Um, I chose the commercial bar really because of the variety of cases that it engages and the variety of sectors that it spans. And you can really see that in the types of cases that barristers in the commercial world tend to deal with. So why don't I, why don't I go through some of the cases that I've seen in practice um, to give you a flavor of how varied it can be. So at a general commercial set, uh, like one is called, the disputes that we're instructed on typically are business disputes and they don't really cover one area of law necessarily. They, they span anything that, that a business requires representation and advice on. In general though, they tend to be contractual disputes and um, they can arise, I suppose, in a, very, in a variety of different contexts. So to give you an example, I did a trial earlier this year, which uh, was a dispute about a residential management contract over a luxury um, set, set of flats. And the dispute was whether a key person had been appointed according to the terms of the contract. So at one level, it was a factual dispute about what had happened and whether the, uh, whether the, the procedures had been followed and what had been communicated by one side to another. And then you had to distill those facts and um, have some legal analysis as to whether or not those contractual requirements, requirements were satisfied by what had emerged in the facts. And that's really typical of what uh, commercial barristers do. That's really typical of what, what barristers do in general. The other sorts of cases that I've come across and that I tend to deal with it are uh, a civil, civil fraud disputes, which um, I saw uh, a fair bit of during my time as a pupil. 
So one of the cases uh, I was able to observe and work on was the uh, dispute between HB and autonomy, where HB having purchased autonomy for uh, five or six billion dollars, uh, realized that the uh, there were some accounting concerns around the business and they argued that the business had been overinflated in terms of its value. So they, they paid more for it than they should have done had they, had they um, accounts not being put forward in a certain way and that was their allegation. So they sued the former directors of autonomy um, in fraud and misrepresentation and um, brought other claims against those directors. And that was a huge trial and a really interesting dispute to be uh, to be assisting on. The other sorts of claims that I've become more involved in are group litigation claims brought against corporate defendants. So in uh, one of the disputes that I've worked on a lot this year has been the uh, Mariana disaster claim, which uh, which involved 200,000 claimants, Brazilian claimants, bringing uh, actions against BHP for the injuries or damages that they suffered as a result of the dam in Mariana collapsing. And that, again, gives you an idea of how different the context is. In one case, we're talking about the acquisition of a company. In another case, we're just talking about what happened around the facts of the um, of a dam collapsing. And the third sort of case that I've been involved in is not really an area of law or a particular type of claim, um, but they're, they're really common in uh, commercial disputes, and that's arbitration, it's essentially a process by which two parties decide that they'll appoint their own tribunals to decide what what the outcome of their dispute is going to be. It's usually a confidential process. I've tend to see them, I've tend to, tended to see them more in the energy sector, but really anything that has a contractual basis could result in an arbitration. And they have their own sort of specialist processes um, and they can be quite fun to work on as well. Uh, in terms of what I find appealing about this area of practice, it's really, as I've said, the variety of cases you're you're kind of bringing your contract and taught toolkit to a particular set of facts and um, trying to figure out what the answer is. And I really enjoy that. The other aspect that's quite fun about these sorts of cases, which AJ has talked about a little, is, is working with detail. You have to kind of get used to drilling down and really figuring out what happened or what the law is in a particular area. And that makes you an expert on, on what you've looked at. And I, I really enjoy that. Um, quite often as well in commercial cases, you're working in a big team of barristers or with a large team of solicitors. And that is a very nice um, flavor of the work or that adds a very nice dimension to the work that would otherwise be quite isolating. So I quite enjoy that in terms of this area of practice. Finally, I guess you have to be quite practical about the advice you give. You're advising businesses about what to do and they want to know what the answer is, what the best options are for them. And coupling that legal analysis with real practical and creative solutions is, is quite fun. Um, so that's, that's why I find commercial practice really appealing. I'll talk uh, very briefly about the lifestyle implications. Um, AJ has talked about kind of the, the need to get going and be, and be um, able to deal with, deal with things in an urgent way. The necessary implication of that are long hours, and there's no shying away from that, in, especially in the commercial world. Um, that can mean working later than you would otherwise, working the weekends when you don't want to. Uh, but equally, <laughs> it's much better than the work-life balance that commercial solicitors tend to have. Um, from my own experience, I've found that I know when I'm going to be in court in large chunks of time, quite well in advance, so that allows me to, to have some sort of predictability about my work-life balance. So I can plan for a horrific March 2021, but I know that April 2021, I will be not working and be sunning somewhere abroad. And um, uh, and that's fine with me. I think it's a compromise thing that, or a decision that each person has to make for themselves. Um, in terms of skills and personal qualities that I think are quite important for barristers, in terms of skills, I've already talked about the need to enjoy working with detail, the need to have an analytical mind, and also the ability to work under time pressure. I think as personal qualities, they probably translate to being quite self-motivated. 
you're you, in, in the independent commercial bar anyway, you're self-employed, so you don't have someone telling you what to do. You have to have the initiative to figure out what the answers are, what the work is that needs to be done, and then get on with it. Um, you also need to be quite brave. Your role is to advise a client and tell them what the answer is. Quite often, the buck will stop with you. So you have to be able to stick your neck out, say the answer is X or Y. And equally in court, you have to persuade a judge to, to, uh, to believe in what you're saying and, and that that is right, even when at a first glance, they're not particularly convinced by that. And finally, uh, you have to be fairly personable, I think. Um, that translates a little bit into being a personal advocate, but also working in a large team requires you to be able to get along with people to a certain extent. So all of those things probably make for um, a good candidate to come to the bar. And if that sounds like you, then you should really consider the commercial bar. But on that note, I'll hand over to Lucy. Hi, everyone. Um, right, well, I agree with everything um, AJ and Vina have said. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about um, the commercial bar from the point of view of the area that I practice in, which is um, uh, basically major projects that go wrong, um, which is known in, 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 in the bar world as construction. Um, but the kinds of disputes I do range from uh, construction projects, energy projects. We also do IT disputes about IT projects because they give rise to the same kinds of issues. Um, I um, um, I got I took silk in 2018, um, but all the things I'm going to say um, really stem from my experience as a junior barrister, and um, so you shouldn't think that I'm sort of grand and uh, and, and remote from your experience because I can vividly remember applying for pupillage and doing my pupillage. Um, I'm going to whiz through the topics that we're that we that we've been given, um, which the first one is why you chose the bar, and in particular why you chose the relevant area of practice. Um, I didn't really choose the bar. I um, graduated from university, having done English literature, and didn't know what to do for for the rest of my life. Um, so I took a year off, came back, still didn't know. Then someone said to me, "Why don't you become a barrister?" And I did some absolutely minimal research, which at the time, this is 1999, did not involve searching online because the internet basically didn't exist in 99. Um, and decided, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I'll be a barrister. So I got myself onto the um, GDL in Manchester and um, hated it. Um, was incredibly, incredibly bored. Um, but I clung to the belief, which luckily turned out to be right, that the law in practice is very different from academic law. I am now quite a, I'm quite interested in the law these days as a practitioner, and I'm actually quite a sort of black letter academic lawyer myself. But when I was studying it, I, I couldn't really see the point as a purely academic discipline. Um, and I do still believe that the law is interesting mostly as a tool that um, people use in real life to resolve their disputes. Um, I also didn't choose my area of practice particularly either. Um, certainly not in advance. I got pupillage in a um, more general civil and commercial set, um, a great chamber called Two Temple Gardens. And in that chambers, my second pupil supervisor specialised in construction. And I just fell in love with it. And so I decided that that's what I was going to specialise in, um, which is harder in a more general set. It's, it's, it's difficult to be a more specialist commercial person in a more general set. But from day one, I was marketing myself as being interested in construction, doing loads of talks, writing essays and articles, getting them published in the various industry papers, and generally um, shoving myself down the throats of solicitors that practiced in the area that I wanted to practice in. And by the time I was about three years call, I had a construction practice um, and I was effectively sort of headhunted by Keating, although that's a sort of weird word to use to describe moving a set of chambers. It's still not quite like that. I moved to Keating, which is a set that specializes in the kind of work I love doing. And um, what we do is we basically argue about building projects that go wrong. And our area of work is also very international because um, the countries that are still building their, their infrastructure and, and um, for example, huge energy projects are all over the world. And quite often the people parties agree in their contracts that the dispute will be subject to English law. Um, and even when they don't, they um, often, they're almost all agreeing to um, arbitrate their disputes rather than have them resolved in the local courts, because quite often there are significant 
um, issues with the justice and particularly the speed of the justice that you get in the, the courts that are local to the project. So people agree to arbitrate and then they want the best advocates mm -hmm. and the English bar is a global export known to be the best um, across the world. Um, and so we get picked to act in international arbitrations in where you might have a two parties, one of whom might be um, the UAE government and the other one might be a Turkish contractor and the project might be in Bahrain. Um, so you can have a huge, as, as Vijay was saying, a huge, a huge mix of um, mixture of, of, of nationalities involved and you are then arguing the arguing the case on the contract. Um, what I find appealing about my area of practice um, is the combination of the intellectual challenge that comes with doing commercial work. So lots and lots of serious sort of black letter contract law interpretation, hard intellectual concepts and applying complicated facts to what might seem like simple le legal principles. Um, that that's fascinating and it's difficult every day and it was it was hard on day one of pupillage and it's hard I can tell you on whatever it, what I own in now year 19. Um, I still go around to my neighbours in chambers saying what what do you think this clause means? Um, you know help me out here um, what you know this sentence makes no sentence makes no sense when joined up with that sentence um, but in construction in particular it is that, that, that intellectual challenge is combined with um, complicated and interesting um, factual and technical questions and you don't have to have this is a real feature of co commercial law generally you don't have to have any pre-qualifications any particular technical area you don't have to know about banking for example you don't have to know about how pure insurance works you don't have to know how to build when we say the or the shard or um, a railway or an oil rig you um, you meet people who will teach you as part of the case um, either the experts that your client has hired or your client often your client itself is an expert in the particular industry they're in and they will teach you and they um it's a little bit often like people talk about sort of being interested in things like clinical negligence because they want to learn how to do heart surgery and cross-examine a heart surgeon you might have got something got something wrong and commercial work has a lot of that element to it too you 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 become a specialist a mini specialist in the area that's in dispute and you get good enough to cross-examine an engineer yourself even if, like me, you are an arts graduate and had no prior experience in that area. I find that as obviously intellectually challenging and it's enormously, enormously fun. Um, and I particularly love also the clients in construction because um, they are all shrewd, practical people. And a, a particular thing I love about my area of practice is that I'm often advising on a live, a live project. I'm, I'm involved during the project. Somebody wants to know, um, you know, Lucy, can we drop, can we, can we down tools or not? Um, tomorrow because um, we haven't been paid for three months whatever whatever the issue might be um, and so you're 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 you've got um, lots and lots of responsibility um, and uh, as Vina was saying but also all the power and I am totally fine with all the responsibility as long as I've also got all the fire all the power as well um, and, and, and it's really what when people get stressed it's because they've got responsibility but no power um, so actually it's fine um, Lifestyle implications quickly um, and key skills and personal personal qualities. Um, I do work work really hard, but I am a very 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 lazy individual, and I often describe the commercial bar as a series of a sort of essay crises that you're like you just live in essay crisis life all the time. And if if that's the sort of thing that got you off your ass during your academic career. Um, which it did me, you know, if I didn't have an essay crisis, I was definitely down the pub or just reading a book or something. Um, and I'm the same now, I haven't, I haven't changed. So I'm, I don't actually like talking about sort of the personal qualities that people need to become a barrister. You definitely need some skills. You, you need to, um, you need to be uh, clever and you need to have a particular sort of forensic mind and you need to be very sort of uh, common sense um, and shrewd. I think there's a, you can hear from what, um, from what Vinay Ajay said that, there's a there's a real um, practical element to the advice you give. It's no one's really very interested in hearing about the 1975 House of Lords case. What they want to know is, am I going to win or am I going to lose, and what shall I do? What shall I do now to put myself in the best position? Um, so you need you need skills. You need to be a good advocate um, in writing and and orally and so on. But I I don't think that you need to be any particular kind of person. 
anyone can be a good barrister. Um, and I know this question about personal qualities isn't directed at um, things like what, what people's background is, but I think quite often candidates think it is. They, they, they think, am I, the, am I the kind of person that's going to make it at the commercial bar? And the answer is, yes, you are. There is no kind of person that can't make it. You've just got, you've got to have skills, um, not be a particular way. So you don't have to be super aggressive. You also don't have to be super understated. You, you, you don't have to be naturally hardworking, although unless you're a genius, you will end up being hardworking at the commercial bar. Um, but you know, we want geniuses too. I'm always saying, um, I'm always saying in chambers when we're talking about things like what are our selection criteria and hard working comes up as a potential one. I would say, no, no, no. What if they're just a genius they, and they can do what takes all of us two weeks in 10 minutes? We want them too. <laughs> if you're able to be a lazy commercial barrister and a good one, no one is going to object to that. Um, and just on the sort of um, lifestyle, I mean, as I say, I do end up working hard, um, but I also take long holidays. My personal aim nowadays is to only work nine months of the year. I usually end up working 10 months of the year, so I don't, I don't quite meet my aims. And unless you think that's a, like a grand QC-ish, oh, Lucy's able to sort of sit back on her laurels. I have been taking five weeks off every summer since I was three years cool. Um, so you can make the decision yourself and you can say, this is the deal that I am doing. Um, I, I will, I, you know, I'm working hard, I'm ambitious. I want the best practice I can possibly get, but then I'm gonna have long holidays where I turn the email off. That's all I do, I turn the email off. Um, so I'll finish up there because I know there's probably questions um, which are very welcome everybody. Please don't go quiet. Brilliant, thank you so much everyone. That was really, really interesting and useful. Um, we have got a few questions. I'll just read them off my screen. Um, so firstly, you might have covered this already, but how do you determine whether you are well suited for the commercial bar? Who wants to go first? You just need to measure yourself against the selection criteria that the sets publish. Take all the chambers who are recruiting, they're telling you what they want. They've got some selection criteria, they've written it down. That's how you determine. Go and have a look at the selection criteria. Definitely, 100% agree with that. I think also, um, if you're able to do many people, I do find that being able to go in and see, see what it's like and see the kind of cases people are doing is, is a great way. I think you'll find probably if you do many people across a few different areas, you're naturally drawn to certain areas. I think things will just jump out at you as being more interesting than other things. Yeah. So I think that that, that is another... You, you find it out as you're doing it, don't you? Minis help. And then in pupillage, you'll find it, it, in any area of commercial work, you'll, there'll be a bit that you like. And you're, then you'll, you'll do that bit. I know during the pandemic, lots of people have said it's quite difficult to get mini pupillages and get sort of the live experience that allows you to make that decision. So one nerdy thing that I did and I highly recommend is reading commercial court judgments. Um, don't read the ones that are hundreds of pages long, read the shorter ones and, and think, oh, is this interesting to me? Or can I see myself doing this? Um, if all you have is a laptop and you're stuck in your room, that's one way to get a feel for it. I, I, um, I would be happy to agree with that. I suppose the only thing I would, I would say is that um, having been involved in a few cases, which I find the judgments fascinating, but I can imagine that people not involved in that particular case might not find them fascinating. I'd say, don't worry, don't worry. If you read the judgments, you think, well, this, this seems a bit nothing to me. I can promise yeah. you that when you've been the one who's been involved in that case for many months and you know all the arguments and you know which way it could have gone and which way it did go, that it, that really does bring it to life. So I suppose, I suppose Venus is the gold standard. If you can read any commercial court judgment and immediately be enthused, then you should most definitely be applying. Yeah. Even if that's not the case, I wouldn't rule it out. No, I mean, I, I think I, it's time for me to admit that before I started pupage, I'd literally never read a single case, not one. Um, so um, that's because I almost failed the GDL because I met someone nice and just went out drinking and was quite bored on it, as I previously said. Um, you, 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 I, I, there are virtual minis happening. Um, so check all the different chambers and try and do some virtual minis. Um, it, it, is, it is obviously the pandemic is a real, it is a real downer. Really great answers, everyone. Um, the next one is kind of in two parts. Um, how long did it take you to secure a pupillage? And what stood out the most from your pupillage interview or what kind of took you by surprise? You guys should go first. You're nearer to it than me. 
I, I applied in um, 2016 and then again in 2017, and that's when I got pupillage. So it took me two rounds to get pupillage. Um, I, in my first round, I, I sort of didn't really go for commercial sets. And then during the course of that year, I realized actually I wanted to do commercial uh, work and then had a more kind of focused and um, successful round in the following year when I applied to this commercial set. What took me by surprise were sort of so-called curveball questions that are <laughs> that are quite standard actually. Um, questions like who will you have around for dinner and you know what TV series do you enjoy the most? You don't really prepare to answer questions like that in a professional interview setting and there's a question about whether or not they should be asked at all in the first place but um, those sorts of questions are they are intended to take you by surprise and um, it's best to prepare for them to the extent they're still being asked. Uh, for my part, I, um, in terms of how long it takes to get people, um, I got people the first year I applied, but I wouldn't attach any importance to that um, because inevitably in any interview process and any application process, there's going to be an element of, um, you know, luck and randomness. So I, I wouldn't in any way discourage people from applying um, in multiple rounds at all. Um, what took me by surprise interviews? First, I'll take this opportunity to plug a gap in my original talk by saying where, where I actually practiced, which I realised I hadn't said. I'm at Blackstone Chambers. Um, what pleasantly surprised me about the selection process? Well, I was got a free burrito by someone at Blackstone during my mini pupillage, which, which was lovely and, and was very nice. Um, in terms of the interviews, I, I was struck by how much there was an emphasis, amongst other things, on really getting a feel for how much you know, I liked and how much I wanted to go. I mean, that's, that, as I say, that goes back to the enthusiasm and the interest, which I think, in a way, in any interview, that's, that's always the, the subtext. And in a way, the most important thing is, is to convey how much you, you know, if it's something you want to do, then that's got to come across because the ability will, you know, I'm, I'm sure that um, almost everyone applying to lots of places is a fantastic um, lawyer and, and is very, very good. But as I say, it's that enthusiasm, which which is being, you know, which is on, on show as well during interviews. Um, I, I also got pupillage the first time around, but I was, I was rejected by um, eight of the top commercial sets that I applied to and got interviews at. Um, and as I say, when I got pupillage in a more general civil commercial set, which was probably regarded as not a top chambers, more the sort of second tier. Um, and I've moved to a top tier chambers. Um, so, you know, don't, um, don't give up. And I, and I was also absolutely terrible at doing interviews. I, I, I performed terribly in all of my posh commercial set interviews, partly through just sheer terror. Um, and I think, I think I'm a, I've got a state school background and I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge and I was quite, an unpolished candidate um, when I was applying for my, and, and I hadn't read any cases, like there were certain disadvantages that I gave myself. Um, but I, I, um, I can remember doing one interview at um, one of the top sets and um, eight people were interviewing me around a table and I was sitting at the far end of the table in a chair with wheels on it. And I was pressing my feet into the floor out of nervousness. And I realized that at the end of the interview, I'd retreated away like two or three feet from the table, away from my interviewers out of sheer, sheer fear so don't don't do things like that don't like actually wheel yourself backwards away from your the panel that are interviewing you um and I think my one of the tip I always give I've been sitting on the pupillage committee in chambers now for years and years and years and one of the things people do is they 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 write things in their form um and then they're asked about them and they can't they can't talk about them so if you say in your form I was super interested in this mini I did about on this particular legal issue brush up on it before your interview you're in control of the narrative at interviews no one knows anything about you except what you've told them. So expect to be asked about it and expect for people to be a bit disappointed if you've said that you found something super fascinating, but you can't, you can't express a view on it when you're asked about it in an interview. So don't shoot yourself in the foot by, um, by, by, by uh, bigging yourself up on the, in, on, the, on the application form and then not being able to back that up in, in real life. Um, and I think, I think, um, AJ just said that um, enthusiasm, I think that's really important. Some, uh, one of, a candidate I was talking to a couple of weeks ago said to me that she'd been given some good advice for her scholarship interviews, which was try and make it sort of fun for the interviewers as well, because they're also having an awful day. <laughs> um, and I think that does come over too. you know, you, we're just people. So just, just talk to us and we, we want you to do well. We want you to, we want you to succeed. Um, so I, I don't I don't want to have a double answer, but I just wanted to pick on something Lucy had said in her original talk, which I think is also really applicable here. 
which is that there's no standard form person who's going to be a good barrister and there's no standard form person who's going to be good in an interview. So I think one thing sometimes, you know, inevitably people have it in court, you know, people have a, have a stereotypical barrister voice they have in mind and everyone slightly gravitates towards that voice. And equally in interviews, I think sometimes people feel that they have to be a particular way because that's what will be expected, which is absolutely not the case. The great leveling factor, both I think in terms of judges looking at cases, but also in terms of interviews, is that people will see merit and will see ability. And that's really the ultimate, you know, that along with enthusiasm is what people are looking for. So, you know, without wanting to go on, I just wanted to completely endorse what, what Lucy was saying in terms of don't have a picture in mind and think that you have to be like that if you're going to, you're going to succeed in the commercial bar or indeed in any part of the bar. Right, thank you everyone, that's really good points. Um, unfortunately, we've not got any time for any more yeah. questions, um, but big thank you to all three of you for taking the time to speak to us today. And I really hope that's been helpful for everyone listening. Thanks very much for Thanks. having us. Thank you.